I am back from holiday and it is time to build the most powerful gaming computer I've ever built. Because in my hands is the brand new RTX 3090 Ti. A graphics card that costs around about £2,000. This is going to be one heck of a gaming PC. It's going to be what the cool kids call lit. Check me out with a lingo fam. In this video, we're going to be building this PC from scratch, step by step, to show you how it's done. We'll talk about things we like and don't like, and of course, we'll show you the full gameplay benchmarks so you know exactly how this thing performs. And ultimately, whether a £2,000 GPU paired with everything else could possibly be worth it. Stay tuned after a short word from this video's sponsor. Turn heads with the remarkable Corsair IQ 5000T RGB. With 208 individually addressable RGB LEDs, three LL fans and a dedicated USB controller for both fan speed and lighting, the IQ 5000T is your surefire way to get the PC build of your dreams. It's spacious, full of airflow and incredibly easy to build in. Get yours today with the link below. Let us begin with the case and first things first, like genuinely this thing is absurdly heavy and I don't understand why. There's not anything in it yet and I know I'm not the strongest person in the world but quite what this thing is made of to make it that heavy is very unusual. You guys have been asking me to build in this case for ages. It is a fan favourite. This is the Lee & Lee 011 Dynamic XL and the cool thing about this is that it's not actually that big. The way that it's designed means that you have two chambers so if you have a look around the back your power supply and things go around this side and then everything you want to see is over this side. And what that ends up doing is meaning it's a lot easier to actually build inside and obviously you get a much cleaner and arguably better looking build as long as you actually get your airflow right. I am struggling a little bit to actually open this though. Is this a pop out job? Ah oh, yes, it turns out that there is a screw that you do need to undo. The instruction says no need to screw normally. Does that mean we go in through the back? One screw at the top, then it just pops out. Not really sure why that's necessary, but it keeps it a little bit more secure, maybe. With that out of the way, you can look at the top piece, which is all mesh, and then you can see the frame itself, which is still very heavy. So I imagine it is the structure itself that takes up most of the weight, but there's definitely loads of expansion room in here. You do have an awful lot of airflow on this thing. You can put fans at the bottom, at the top, along the side, and then obviously one at the rear. You can't put one at the front because it's glass. Let's touch base with that a little bit later. Do you like my Microsoft Teams lingo there? Because it is time to talk about the motherboard. This is the ROG Maximus Z690 Hero. It really is a fantastic looking motherboard actually. I love the fact that you've got this sort of like Tetris-y look on the front. On this side of the board, you've got support for DDR5 memory, so don't buy DDR4, it won't work with this. You've got three M.2 slots for SSDs on the board itself, but then you also have this hyper expansion card in there as well, and one of these will actually support PCI Generation 5, I think. You can tell I've been away on holiday for a little bit because I haven't actually told you the most important thing about this, which is that it is a Z690 motherboard, which means it will support Intel CPUs. So this is the i9-12900K. You can get like a special edition KS variant of this that might be ever so slightly quicker, but I mean, not really. Maybe I should name my child Tim now, and it'll be like this in joke just for PC centric subscribers. So we've opened up the slot, and we will gently drop our CPU into place. We lay it back down, grab the lever, and then remove the cover. We then of course need to add ourselves some RAM. This is some Kingston Fury. The main benefits of going for an RGB-less, more low profile kit is that if you do want to have like a big bulky cooler, it's just not going to get in your way and affect your cooling at all. And then we have the final piece of this motherboard flavoured puzzle. I think I did used to eat puzzle pieces as a kid actually, but I was weird. We have the Kingston KC3000 PCIe 4 SSD. This is exactly the sort of thing that I would recommend for a build like this, not only in terms of its speed, this has read speeds up to 7,000 megabytes a second, which is very impressive and it's going to be brilliant for Microsoft Direct Storage that I think is actually now available for developers, which is pretty fancy. But equally as important if you're building it yourself, you don't want to buy something that has a big heatsink on it if you actually have the capacity for that on your motherboard. So let's remove this massive heatsink from the motherboard and you gently place it down then you can grab your heatsink and give it some screwdriver loving. Motherboard is done. 
Finito. Brown bread. Well, no, it's not. It still works. If you don't know what I'm talking about, brown bread is Cockney running slam for dead. So let's certainly hope not. What I was trying to allude to with a nice little segue before it failed was that we're going to move on to our cooler. This is the Ryogen 360, but it is the second edition. I don't know whether you get the Intel 1700 bracket in the box with this, because they've sent me one separately, but I think I got a pre-release version of this, so it may or may not come with it now. Well, what you will get in the kit is this little bracket that just goes in the back of your motherboard. Pretty much business as usual here. But then you get these slightly longer Intel 1700 mounting screws. You can then start mounting your motherboard inside the chassis. Lee and Lee have been very nice and have already put the ATX standoffs in place for us. Stand it all back up again and you'll actually get your first glimpse of what the PC will look like. Fair bit of room to go this time, but the reason I asked you to actually put that back plate on now is because you will have to take this hard drive cage out in order to access the back of the motherboard. Then we can get our first look at what should be ASUS REG's super duper do it all CPU cooler. I mean, look at the head on that. This actually has a fan in it and an LCD screen. So they've sort of taken the best of what they had before and seen that Corsair and NZXT are doing things that are a little bit more attractive and doing their own. You get three Noctua fans with this, which is pretty nice, and they're all jet black. Now comes the bit of advice that I don't think I've ever offered you guys before, but from experience, do not use the default thermal compound that comes on this with a 12900K. As I found out in my previous video with my own personal PC, it's not really enough to actually cool this thing properly. So I'm just going to take this away and then I'll be adding my own just before we put the head on the CPU. Installing radiator in this chassis is really easy because you can mount the fans directly to the bracket and then put the bracket in. Lay these on top of your radiator and make sure the fan cables are gonna be going that way. It is definitely worth mentioning that the reason we're using a 360 all-in-one here is because this is definitely a chip that needs a lot of cooling. Like the amount of power this thing consumes is ridiculous. I mean, it doesn't have to, but ultimately if you want the best level performance, then you're gonna have to unlock this thing and let the motherboard actually put as much juice into it as it wants. So by having a big cooler like this, you're actually able to keep the temperatures under check and hopefully the noise level's in line too. Quickly go and put some deodorant on because you didn't do it this morning and you stink. In my defense, I was away at the weekend. So it's in my travel bag. And then now you can grab your thermal paste. I'm gonna do quite a large amount really considering. I do a little line and then two dots. The whole thing should just line up with the holes. I mean, here you can see the little fan that's inside, which does worry me a little bit because generally speaking, small fans are bad, but you'd like to think that if ROG are gonna put it in this, it's only gonna come on when it's necessary. We can then start thinking about cable management and there are gonna be quite a few things to manage here today, unfortunately. Here is a hub. We get these all of the time. You can plug in a load of different ARGB devices and then all of your fans. But while this is powered over SATA, it looks to me as if the pump itself is connected with just one single micro USB. But this isn't something I think I've ever seen before. I hope it works. As always, we also have all of our cables around the back for the front panel. So here we've got USB 3, USB C, a front panel connection that does all of them in one, which I always really like to see. And then usually at this stage, I'd say connect your fans with the RGB connection and the fan header connection, but obviously, there aren't any, which is something I actually really like about Lean Lee cases because realistically, who uses the stock fans on expensive cases anyway? You're always gonna get your own. And we're sticking with the Lean Lee theme. Here we've got some Unifans AR120s in black. And these are gonna look glorious. And the cool thing about the Unifans is that they do actually stick together and then you have one controller that sort of does everything. Line them up and then they just lock in like that. We can repeat that with a third fan. And then this should just tuck into the case like so. We do also need to put one at the back as well and you could use this as an intake or an exhaust but I'm thinking intake. And then this is where the cable management is definitely going to get a little bit tricky because we have a couple of different boxes to connect now. We've got the Lee and Lee one 
And then we also have this one from RUG. Obviously it doesn't really matter to you guys because you didn't get to see it, but just as an FYI in terms of time, I think it's probably taken me around about 40, 45 minutes to get this cooler and all of the fans in. But now it's time for, I think, the final piece of the puzzle actually, bar the graphics card, the 1000 watt power supply. This one is from Deepcool, this is the PQ1000M. I think they've actually sent this out for a sponsored video a little bit later in the year, but I've always been a big fan actually of Deepcool power supplies because they always do the job very well. And also they come in at a slightly lower price point than some of the competition. But when you're using a graphics card that can take up to 450 watts with an i9-12900K, realistically under load you're going to get like 700, 800, maybe 850 watts on this thing, depending on whether you overclock it or not. So I really do think 1000 watts is the minimum. Grab your bundle of cables and actually put the power supply in the hole at the back. Screw it in nice and tight start sifting through these cables to actually find the ones that you need. So CPU, for example, goes here at the top. Got your ATX connection, PCIe connections for the graphics card that we'll use in just a second. But then you also have these SATA cables for any sort of accessories and things that you use. So we've got our CPU cooler. You've got one down the bottom for the case lighting. And then there's one more for the RGB Lian Lee fans. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that leaves just one final component our RTX 3090 Ti, 24 gigabyte, 2000 pounds or thereabouts graphics card. Things just got serious. Palette is gonna get all of the headlines for this, which is just like RGB plastic crystalline overload. Like, I get why you might like it, but it's not really for me. However, as soon as you put this in a system more normally, well, you literally can't see any of it at all, and all that happens is you have a lovely RGB plate that sort of shines down and actually illuminates your rig. Couple that with the fact that the cooling on this and the thermals and acoustics is actually really good, and you can usually get this for a bit cheaper than your likes from MSI, ASUS, and Gigabyte. And it actually means that this is probably the RTX 3090 that I would buy, assuming, of course, that this isn't more expensive than its competition. But the thing for me that really gets me with this card is the fact that it's likely to be replaced within the next, like... I don't know, what month is it? April? It's probably got like an eight month shelf life for all we know. And then there'd be an RTX 4080 or something. That will almost certainly be faster than this. And you know what's also ridiculously overkill about this card? The fact that you need this horrible adapter here to actually get this thing plugged in. Because this uses a 16 pin. This is a 12 pin adapter. A few people called me out for it last time and said, no, it's not 16 pin, but it is and it isn't because this is a 12 pin adapter, but then on the card itself, you also have four more pins above it, 16 pin. Essentially what this does is converts three very large 8 pin power connections into one much smaller 12 pin. It's going to look something along the lines of this, which uh, isn't the best, is it? But that is pretty much us done and dusted now. Oh, I think the very last thing to do is just to put this cable management bar back on that you can also put two and a half inch SSDs on. Because look, that just covers up all of those cables there, which leaves you with a pretty immaculate looking system with literally no cable management at all. All in all, I think we've learned that I've made probably the heaviest PC I've built in a long, long time. I think we're ready to actually get testing this thing and see if it works. I'll have you guys know I'm starting to get very hungry now. Lunch has not yet been consumed. I would say what's the time, but I left my watch. So it's currently quarter to arm. Is this the button? Yes. Oh, oh, what are we doing? What are we doing? What's that? I'm a pro at this. Can we get a boot signal though, please? Can we get boot signal? Error code D6. It's never easy, is it? It's very, very confusing. D6 again. I hate problems. Problems are annoying. I've just plugged in a different monitor and now it's working but the monitor's on the floor for context because the cable's not long enough. But that makes no sense whatsoever. I'm not lying, but there's the BIOS. Give me a few hours to get this sorted, and I guess we get playing some games. Ladies and gentlemen, we made it. We have got it up and running, and I honestly don't know what the problem is, whether it was just coincidence, whether it actually was a miscommunication. I don't know. But all that matters is the rig is actually all set up and it looks absolutely fantastic on the desk. You can really understand why so many people rave about this case. It's just such a nice mix between elegant, suave, sophisticated, but still very PC gamery because of course you have all of that 
RGB lighting shining through the very dark tinted glass. But of course, this is not just a pretty face. How is it going to perform in some games? Well, first up, we've got some Far Cry 6. This is running with ray tracing, absolute max settings at 4K. Granted, we are using AMD's Fidelity FX technology. We're running this at the quality settings, so we're getting ourselves a little bit more frame rate. But here you can see the highest frame rate I think I've seen from Far Cry 6, which of course makes sense. It's an RTX 3090 Ti. But then again, it does show you the limitations, if you like, of running at 4K resolution, because even with this setup, you're still not able to fully saturate a monitor like this, all its resolution, all of its refresh rate, with all of the settings turned up to max. Something else I'm gonna quickly show you just for fun is my live readout of how much power my house is actually using at the moment, and it shot up to around about 0.9 kilowatt hours as soon as this PC started gaming. So we're using around about 650 watts of energy. That is quite a lot. Next up, we have some Forza Horizon 5, and this is one of the most demanding games I think you can actually get on PC at the moment. It is very scalable, so you can play it on something a bit lower end, but running this at the extreme preset like we have here at 4K is no easy task. And this is where there is actually a noticeable improvement in terms of the way the game feels versus a 3080 Ti that I'm used to playing this game on. We're getting around about 95 FPS or so, whereas we'd probably be getting around about 70 75-ish. So it is a very subtle difference, but if you're wanting to play competitively and still have everything turned up to max, I think you're going to very much appreciate the difference. I'm also going to take this opportunity to actually say my new favourite thing about this system, which is the noise levels. You think how much power this is consuming, we have literally just showed you, but listen to this. It's pretty much inaudible. Our multiplayer game of choice is going to be some Halo Infinite. But something I do quickly want to show you is the VRAM usage. Because as we go over to our settings here, everything is at max. We've got 3840 by 2 and 60. And this really does tell the story. We're currently using around about 8.26 gigabytes of VRAM in a very demanding game. Everything turned up. And we have... 24 available. Do you understand why you don't need 24? So, bang, here we go, here we go, here we go. And yeah, there is no doubt that this is the best experience. We're getting pretty much the best of everything at the moment, around about 90 frames a second with everything turned up to max. In terms of thermals, by the way, this is holding up remarkably well. We're getting around about 77 degrees on the GPU, which does make sense. But interestingly, on that CPU, only around about 59 degrees. That's a lot lower than I would expect. That means you can actually do a little bit more with this CPU if you want. If you want to put more power into it, overclock it a little bit, then there should be some headroom here. The only thing I will say about the cooler is while it is very impressive in terms of thermals, I'm not sure that the software for the screen is being properly utilized at the moment. It is a little bit bare bones when you compare it to NZXT and Corsair, what you can actually do on theirs. All in all, I'd say it is very bittersweet with this system because obviously it's fantastic. I love the way it looks. I think everything is actually themed very well together, despite the fact that it looked a little bit strange when we didn't have the glass on. It all makes sense once that's on. Who is this for, realistically? Anyone that's a creator that needs all of that VRAM or anyone that just has a silly amount of money, this is not an endorsement for spending this amount of money because you can have a very similar PC gaming experience for probably about half of all of this. But if you demand the very best, then this is it. If you've enjoyed this video, then please smash the like button. It really helps out. And of course, get yourself subscribed. If you want to check out current pricing about anything in this rig, then you can find that link down below with my Amazon affiliate links as always. And while you're down there, why not bask in the glorious RGB lighting of the Corsair IQ 5000T RGB. Built to accommodate the most hardcore of gaming rigs, this fully airflow orientated case supports up to 10 fans for masses of cooling potential and is perfect for the latest graphics cards and power hungry processors. Get your build on today with that link down below. But thank you so much for watching this video. I'll catch you in the next one.